hopefully I've helped you begin to understand how important this, this topic of honeybee nutrition is. Um, as I've pointed out to you, nutrition is involved in the determination of the female caste, whether it be a queen or a worker. Um, we tried to point out to you that the queen's diet is very specialized and changes with age and development. And when we look at the actual diet of the bees, we see that there are three major components. Pollen, or a protein source, nectar or honey, or a carbohydrate source, and water. Colony development and reproduction is dependent on the protein source. I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but it affects the production of vitellogenin. It, it's involved in the storage of nutrients in fat bodies uh, within the bees. Um, protein is extremely important in the development of the hypopharyngeal glands or the brood food glands or the production of, of royal worker and uh, drone jelly. You probably don't think about water as being a vital component to the nutrition of the bee, but it is. When you think of water, you think about air conditioning. Bees go out and collect water to air condition the hive, to regulate the temperature. But it's also important in their diets. It carries dissolved materials to all parts of their body within the, the blood or hemolymph of the bee. It assists in the removal of waste products from the bee and it's involved in digesting and metabolizing of their food. Nectar is their carbohydrate source. Here we see the, a picture of a cucumber nectary. This is actually in a female or pistillate cucumber flower. Uh, the, the nectary is cup shaped as you see here and you can see the accumulation of nectar below the, the stigmatic surface uh, of the female flower. The carbohydrate source is their energy source. So in order for them to produce heat in the winter cluster, in order for them to fly, uh, in order for them to raise brood, they have to have a source of energy and that energy comes from either nectar or the product honey or sugar syrup or sugar candy that you might uh, feed your bees. Pollen is extremely important in colony development. Let me go back and make a point. That this will probably be made later, but I may not get to it. If a colony is starving, survival comes from a carbohydrate source, whether it be sugar, nectar, or honey. All right? They can have, and I'm, just, I'm going to be facetious here, they could have a ton of pollen in a hive, but if they do not have a carbohydrate source of food, they're going to die. Okay? So survival is related to carbohydrates. Whereas reproduction, growth, development, egg production are all related to proteins. And those proteins are derived primarily from pollen. Pollen provides proteins, amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Okay, they're the building blocks of proteins. Uh, minerals, vitamins, fats, and sterols all come from pollen. So together, honey plus pollen gives them a complete balanced diet. But you need to realize that, that now all pollens are not nutritionally alike. Uh, the protein content of pollens can vary anywhere from 10 to 36 percent. Bees generally collect and utilize a variety of pollens and this is extremely important. Let me give you one example. 
dandelion pollen, lacks in two essential amino acids. So if I took dandelion pollen and I fed a colony nothing but dandelion pollen and they didn't have access to any other protein source, reproduction would stop. Reproduction would fail. So this, this buffet of different types of pollens is extremely important in the development and reproduction of a colony. When we think of pollen, we think of that pollen pellet on the hind legs. Was it in the last picture? That pollen pellet on the hind legs that the bees have gone out and collected. But you need to realize that bees collect a lot of windborne pollens, pollens associated with grasses, pollens associated with ragweed, pollen associated with corn. And those to the bees, even though there are a quantity of pollen, nutritionally is very, very poor. Okay? So it's, it's the pollen from the floral sources that are, are most important. Um, as we said, many individual pollens are nutritionally inadequate, lacking in certain amino acids required by bees. There's, a, there's some 20 plus amino acids. Ten of them are essential in order for bees to reproduce. Now, I don't expect you to remember this, but just so you realize, this is the list of the 10 amino acids that are absolutely necessary in order to have reproduction and bee development. As I indicated, like dandelion, many pollens lack in some of these. And that's why it's important that we have a mixture of pollens coming from many different sources so that within the colony all ten of these uh, will be present. Sugars are an important part of uh, the bee's diet. We've got sucrose, glucose, and fructose. When nectar and pollen are not available, the bees go, when weather permits, the bees will go out and collect other things that probably are not nutritionally of any value to the bees, but they just have that hoarding instinct, that, that foraging instinct. Uh, I didn't throw a picture in, in this particular presentation, but they love to rob my bird feeder. Yes, yes. <laughs> bird seed is of no value to them, but they will work my bird feeder all day long. They'll collect uh, juices from rotting fruits under trees. Uh, they'll collect honeydew. Honeydew is a product similar to nectar. However, it's produced by plant sucking insects, such as leaf hoppers, scale insects, aphids. They stick their proboscis, the aphid or the the plant sucking insect sticks their proboscis into the vascular system of the plant and take on all of this juice that's moving through the vascular system of the plant and they can't handle it and so most of it comes right out the other end. Um, aphids have two little tailpipes <laughs> and that's where the excess goes. So you park under a tree and you come out later and your windows, windshield's all gummed up with sticky material, there's probably a high population of plant-sucking insects up there that are releasing all this honeydew. In the absence of a good nectar source, the bees will collect it. It's, and they will make it into honey, or so-called, we'll call it honeydew honey. <laughs> Chemically, it's different than regular honey. Uh, it's not considered to be a good wintering food source, but they will collect it if there's nothing else available. In Europe, there are certain areas of Europe where people prize getting uh, honeydew honey, 
and get, they get a great price for, for it. But we don't have such a market here that I'm aware of. Um, they'll visit uh, animal grain mangers and, and coal dust and caulking from windows, etc. I think from, from the first presentation tonight, it should become evident that extended brood rearing is not possible unless pollen or an appropriate source of protein and vitamins are available. As we said, they can live on pure carbohydrates for extended period of time, but they cannot use pollen as an energy source. Just to give you an idea of how much of these products uh, are necessary in, in the life of a colony. It takes a pound of pollen to produce about a thousand bees. And so the estimates are 150 to 175 pounds of honey are needed for maximum reproduction in a hive over the course of the year. Then as beekeepers, we want another 75, 100, or 125 pounds, okay? Man, it's hard to believe that stack of boxes and all that raw product is going through there. What they need is plus what we think we need, okay? Pollen, takes about a pound of pollen to produce uh, 4,500 bees, and so we're talking about another 100 pounds of product that's gonna be required uh, each season. Adult queens obtain protein from royal jelly that's fed to them by nurse bees throughout their egg-laying life. Adult workers obtain their protein from, from pollen, and it's necessary for the development of the hypopharyngeal or the brood food glands, as we'll, we'll point out here in, in just a minute. Um, the drones, well, they get their pollen from, uh, from food that's supplied by young nurse bees. They go around begging, and that's how they, they get their protein source. This is the important aspect of it. If young workers do not consume needed proteins, the brood food glands will not develop completely. In other words, all those little ASCII or all those little bunches of grapes as it looks like, not all of those will develop. Their royal jelly will not support normal growth and development of larvae and will not support egg production uh, in the queen. Not only do they need a source of protein, these young nurse bees also need a good source uh, uh, of vitamins and minerals as well. Vitalogenin is the main storage protein in honeybee hemolymph. I didn't talk about it last time, I skipped over it because we're running out of time. Vitalogenin is produced by the fat bodies of the bee. It's stored, it's stored protein in their bodies in the form of fat bodies. Uh, I got a lot of stored. Okay, um, vitalogenin is also all these eggs that are developing in the ovarials receive vitalogenin. That's their nourishment in, in order to have complete egg development uh, as well. So this is, you can see how important protein is. I'm going, okay, I'm just going to jump ahead here just a little bit. There's a picture of royal jelly or queen jelly as we talked about earlier. When pollen is packed in the cells, the field bee comes in and she backs into a cell and with the spines on her legs she kicks, his, kicks those pellets off. Um, and you can see kind of loose pellets right here in this particular slide. Now in forming that pellet she adds some nectar. She probably adds some products from exocrine glands, but we don't know totally what, what that might be at this particular time. And then the bees come along and ram it with their heads and they pack it tight in the cell. When that cell is about two-thirds full, then they will put a small layer of honey on top of it. Now after that cell is packed and the airs, the excess air is pushed out and the honey and the other possible secretions are added, then that honey will begin to 
ferment. Okay? And that's what forms bee bread. What we're saying is it keeps the pollen from spoiling. It also keeps the pollen um, or begins pre-digestion of the pollen is what I want to say. And they're finding now, now that some of the products that sec secreted by the bees and mixed in the pollen contains various forms of lactic bacteria. All right? And so we sometimes refer to this as lactic fermentation. But it's part of pre-digestion. It's part of keeping the product pure for the bees. Uh, the last article in American Bee Journal by Randy Oliver talked some. He went back to look at um, bee bread and he said in the next issue he's going to relay some new findings. So I kept hoping. I kept hoping <laughs> my issue would arrive before I left. It didn't. So what I'm saying to you, look at your next American Bee Journal and maybe we'll have some new findings, that, a better understanding in the, the formation uh, of bee bread. Anytime there's less than three, free, three full frames of honey in a colony, they should be fed. When you're taking your honey off, I like to recommend that you always leave one full super of honey because you don't know what the rest of the season is going to turn out to be. Okay? Uh, you don't want feeding is expensive feeding is laborious now you can be greedy and you may end up paying for it or you can leave adequate food for the bees so that you won't have to feed do not feed brown sugar or molasses honey is good as long as you're absolutely sure that it's free of disease Never buy honey to feed bees. You have no idea what's in it. All right, I'm out of, just about out of time, I, but I'm going to give you just a, res a recipe for the making of, of sugar candy. There are lots of recipes out there. This will be just one in case you have colonies that, that need food to get through the winter. All right, 15 pounds of sugar, 3 pounds of glucose or white corn syrup, four cups of water, and a half a teaspoon of cream of tartar. You need to use a candy thermometer. If you make Christmas candy and you cook it too long, it's so hard that it nearly breaks your teeth. If you don't cook it enough, it's so sticky you can't get it off your teeth. So, so to get the right consistency for the bees, it's important that you use a candy thermometer. And what we do is we heat this mixture to 242 degrees, then we remove it from the heat source, and we begin to stir it and beat it until it thickens. And I like to just use a, a disposable aluminum pie tin, put in a sheet of wax paper, pour the mixture in, once it solidifies, then it's just a matter of flipping it over right above the, the cluster of, of the bees and it gives them a, a good source of food that does not contain too much moisture so you won't have problems uh, with um, dysentery. And normally what you do is just put an empty hive body there and then the lid above that. Um, you could put newspaper over it, you could put a burlap bag over it or something. To, again, if I was talking about wintering, one point that I would make to you is bees do not heat the entire hive. They heat only the area of the cluster. But some of that heat escapes. And so it, putting uh, some uh, insulation, newspaper, burlap or something over this sugar, uh, uh, piece of molded sugar fondant, uh, that will help conserve some of that heat energy. Hopefully I've given you something to think about tonight, something that you can use in your beekeeping operation. It's been a pleasure being here. I want to wish each of you the best of luck in, in your beekeeping operations. <laughs>